Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, my name is Anna Fonsu. I'm the head of the Nutrition and Food Innovation Unit. And so I will share this uh, info session. So um, I would like to start just to explain to everybody what is an info session, um, provide some house rules, and also give you some clarifications regarding the agenda and what we're going to do next. So first of all, an info session is one of the tools that EFSA is using for engagement with its stakeholders. It normally it goes uh, as a way of communicating some of our scientific outputs, so we're not here discussing specific applications. That's not part of the remit. Um, and it, it really is an inter, um, a way to have an open dialogue with our stakeholders. Now, so quite different from other kinds of engagement we have, which are specifically directed at applicants and for which probably my colleague Catalina will talk later on. Now, um, maybe we can just go into the agenda, please. Next slide. OK, so first of all, thank you very much for registering and for attending. We had a very large number of registrations. Um, I see that the number of attendees is also growing and uh, it's normal people take a few minutes to get in. So we had to rethink a little bit of our, our agenda to make sure we have enough time to cover all the necessary points. So as you see, I will uh, I'm just opening the event. Then I will pass the floor to my colleague Anna Maria uh, Rossi to provide you a sort of, um, brief overview and the background of the statement that we have in discussion today. And then I will ask our experts. Uh, so uh, Harry McCardell, of, uh, member of the NDA panel, to go through um, two sections, uh, ADME and, um, and gastrin, and then stop, actually, I making a mistake here, one section, and we will have a small question and answers. Section two will cover gastrointestinal tract, liver, neurological, psychiatric and psychological facts. So all the data gaps that have been identified related to possible adverse effects comprising these organs. And um, these three sections will be um, presented by Harry Inge, another of the NDA panel members. And and also in by Karen, which we know that was having a little bit of issues, but I hope everything goes well with the transmission. And we will then have uh, questions and answer for this section and the following section on endocrine and reprotox effects, which we believe is where most of the interest will focus. And here we will have a slightly longer presentation by Karen and also a question and answers. And finally, uh, our colleague Jose Tarazona will present um, a last section on small particles, including nanoparticles, and again, what was identified for the panel related to this uh, subject. After that, we will have a small, a small presentation from Catalina, uh, who works for the front desk uh, here at EFSA, and she will try and go through what are the requirements for future applications. We will hopefully will have some time for general questions and answers and a concluding we hope to finish by five o'clock. Now, as I said, we had a very large number of registrations, but we also had a large number of questions. We will not be able to uh, probably address all the questions during this session, but we will do our best. But uh, what we intend to do is following this um, info session and also taking the questions that you will put during the session that we will produce a document of frequently asked questions which will be published in our website. So um, what else can I say? Well, please note that this uh, info session will be recorded and the recording would be published in the AFSA website. Um, unfortunately, with this kind of events having a large number of participations, we cannot have live questions, but we will ask you to uh, address your questions on the questions and answers. 
Again, depending on the number of questions and the time we have available, we will try and address as many as possible. The ones we cannot, we will try and, and wrap them up at the end on these frequently asked questions um, a few days after these events. And I think I probably said everything and uh, what I'm missing is a very big thank you for my our experts and for all my colleagues for their work in putting together this uh, info session. I hope you find it useful and a big big thank you for our technical team as well. If you have any problems, please contact Simona or Emma. They will be available to help you. And I th think with this uh, I've have covered everything I had to say and we can start. So next slide, please. So I'll give the floor to Anna Maria. OK, thank you very much, Anna, and uh, thank you for all the participants. Uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, I'm now going to give you an overview on the status and the procedure uh, of the safety assessment of CBD as novel food. Well, uh, we know that in November 2020, the EU Court of Justice uh, ruled that uh, cannabidiol or a CBD cannot be regarded as a narcotic drug. According to the current state of scientific knowledge, unlike THC, the CBD does not seem to have any psychotropic effect. In the European Commission, in its assessment concluded in December 2020, um, basically, uh, sorry, um, concluded that cannabidiol should not be considered as a drug within the meaning of the United Nations Convention Schedule 4 of the 1961 Single Convention of Narcotic Drug. This uh, means that cannabidiol can be qualified as food and in particular as novel food. This because CBD falls into the scope of the EU novel food regulation definition of novel food, where a novel food is defined as any food that was not used for human consumption to significant degrees, degree within the EU before the 15th of May 1997. It should be noted that according to the EU regulation, foods, including novel food, must be safe. Therefore, the opinion of the EFSA are based solely on the analysis of the health risk and must conclude on that basis alone. So, the novel food will be assessed only for the safety and not for potential benefit. Only novel food that are authorized and included in the EU positive list of authorized novel food may be placed on the EU market in accordance with the condition of use and labeling required specified. To gain authorization, an applicant should submit the dossier to the Commission. The Commission will perform a suitability check in conjunction with the uh, EFSA, and later on my colleague Catalina Milieu will give you more information regarding this step. And once the Commission has ended the suitability check, will issue an um, official mandate to EFSA, and EFSA will start the risk assessment. EFSA has nine months to conclude on the risk assessment assessment, but during this period, uh, additional request to the applicant can be uh, done and this will place the risk assessment on hold. Uh, EFSA, at the end of the risk assessment evaluation, will issue a scientific opinion which will be taken into consideration by the Commission and the Member States to decide on the authorization uh, on the market of the novel food and on the labeling as well. As mentioned, uh, during the risk assessment, uh, EFSA can ask for additional data requests. The assessment in this period will be placed on hold until the uh, applicant will, not, uh, submit, will submit the uh, data and all the data will be addressed. It is uh, the applicant's responsibility to provide the data requested and at this stage EFSA cannot provide any scientific advice, but still the applicant can request a clarification teleconference to discuss in depth all the data requested by EFSA. Uh, we would like also to underline that uh, to spare eventually uh, animal, the use of animals uh, and uh, to share a cost, uh, consortia in joint effort to provide the data requested by EFSA uh, are encouraged among the different applicants.
Okay. Evaluation of uh, CBD will follow the approach described in the EFSA NDA panel uh, guidance of the novel food. Uh, basically, in this guidance uh, are given indication to the applicant on the data that they will submit it, and they will be divided in three major parts. A part that re is related to the characterization and uh, the technical data of the novel food. Another part which uh, is related to exposure. And here we should note that exposure assessment is conducted depending whether CBD will be used as a food supplement, where other population only can be considered or if his CBD will be used at food ingredient. In this latter case it, case, it cannot be concluded that a novel food intended for a particular group of population will also be consumed by other groups of this population, such as, for example, children and lactating women. And therefore, the safety data should, uh, sh safety data should be provided also for, to cover uh, for these groups. A third uh, group of data that needs to be submitted are the toxicological data, including ADME, genotoxicity, repeated toxicity studies, and uh, reproductive toxicity studies, and if available, human studies. We have to consider that during the assessment, not only the data that will be submitted, but also the data available in the literature will be taken into consideration for the safety assessment. Finally, as described also in the guidance mentioned above before, uh, the data and evaluation will follow a tier approach, starting from basic request, uh, going up to uh, more uh, demanding uh, data. And if this, of course, if concerns raised during the risk assessment. This approach is applied for all the novel food and it has been already applied for uh, several uh, novel food, um, not only for CBD. I would like now to give the floor to Harry McCardo, uh, which will go more in depth uh, through the uh, panel statement that has been recently published uh, by EFSA. Thank you very much indeed uh, for that um, very helpful background, and I hope that uh, it, it, it paints the picture very well uh, for where we find ourselves now. So if I could have the first slide, next slide please. Have the next slide. Thank you. This is the uh, the cover of the the statement. It's uh, as you see, it's a statement on the safety of cannabidiol as a novel food. And what we're doing is we're looking at the data gaps and the uncertainties. Next slide, please. The scope of the um, the assessment was to identify the hazards of CBD and how they relate to the physical, chemical and pharmacological properties when it's used as a food supplement and or food ingredient. And that's an important point because we're not talking about it being used as a medicine. We're talking about it being used as a food supplement or a food ingredient. Uh, and Anna referred earlier on about how some of the differences of interpretation come because of that. And we will look at that in more detail as we go through the statement. And the other part of the scope of it was to provide an overview of the uncertainties and the data gaps that need to be addressed before we can conclude on the safety of CBD as a novel food. Next slide, please. We adopted um, a fairly comprehensive approach to try and develop the statement. We carried out um, significant um, substantial searches of the scientific literature, looking for animal studies and human studies that focused on data provided for pure CBD because of the fact that some of the mixtures and other things that you can get data on for CBD are quite complicated and quite um, varied. And that provides at least part of the background about why we have some problems. Next slide. So with the toxicology studies that were carried out, there were very varied mixtures. They had different other compounds, other cannabinoids, other, other chemicals in there, and the interactions between CBD and these chemicals and between these chemicals and the body are of course very significant and very um, 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 important to understand. And it became a real problem when it was clear that the content of the other components and their identity are rarely described and even more rarely described in detail and with studies being comprehensive enough to be able to understand their contribution to problems. 
And in humans, where many of the studies have been carried out, they have been carried out involving patients who have refractory epilepsies of different sorts, and they require concomitant use of other medications. That really complicates our assessment of the effect of CBD. And this um, um, became so significant when we're looking at the efficacy of Epidiolex, where adverse effects were sometimes observed, but were tolerated, and it meant that we could derive no Noel from uh, from the uh, studies that we managed to uh, managed to identify. Next slide, please. So in that first section, what in that first section, what I tried to do is just give you a feel for what the, uh, the the problems are that we were faced with, and what we will do in the next few minutes is we'll go through um, these sections in a little bit more detail. So in this part here, what I want to look at is the ADME, the absorption, distribution, metabolism and excretion, and the CBD interaction with drug metabolism. And as I say, this will be done in more detail by other contributors as we, as we go through the process. Next slide, please. So, next slide. Where we identify significant data gaps was in the matrix that was used, how the food was being delivered, whether it was in lipophilic, whether it was in a solution, a suspension, and so on. And it was quite clear that the form of the CBD that was provided and the food that it was in at the same time would make a big difference to the bioavailability and indeed could make a big difference to physiology and to pharmacology. And a very important aspect of the ADME that we identified as a data gap Animal studies suggest that accumulation of CBD occurs with time, so that as animals were given more and more CBD or the same amount of CBD over time, the concentration inside the animals um, increased. And the question is, does this happen at lower doses in humans and do the harmful effects also increase with time? So acute studies will provide us one degree of information, more chronic studies will provide us with more information. Next slide, please. So in the statement, we identified interactions between CBD and neurological drugs. We demonstrated that CBD interacts with a wide range of cytochrome P450s, and the concentrations at which these interactions manifest is not clear. But what it does mean is that CBD can affect the metabolism of other food and drugs, and vice versa, that other food and other drugs can affect the metabolism of CBD. We need to know more about this. Next slide, please. So at this stage, what I've done is given you a little bit of a background. We will look at it in more details, but we'll pause here for a couple of minutes, I think, to uh, ask questions if there is time, and I will um, uh, hand back to the chair to uh, see what questions we have been asked. Thank you, Harry. Okay, I think we don't have any questions live, but we had a question from uh, that was received in advance, and um, and the question is, Harry, is for you actually. What is the expectation of toxical kinetic studies in different food matrices? I think this kind of question actually underlines the general uh, concern that we have. We need to know that CBD is safe. So if somebody is providing, if a company or a, 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 a food, yeah, food company is providing CBD in a food matrix, we need to know that that is not going to have a harmful effect on an individual. So we know we, we, we can identify what the effect is of CBD on its own. The interactions that we'll have with other foods is very important in trying to understand how it might have other consequences. We will look at that in more detail, for example, in terms of liver and some of the other systems as we go through this statement. But I think what we're going to have to do or what anybody is going to have to consider is that the toxicokinetic studies that are going to be required in different food matrices are going to have to relate to the way that anybody is planning on marketing this product. I hope that answers the question. I think so, Simona, can you? I think we have time here for one more question, Harry. Mm -hmm. And 
and that would be how should the effects of CBD on drug metabolism be examined in terms of the number of potential interactions? Yeah, there's a there's an enormous literature on um, the interactions of CBD, um, and we were very fortunate in, in getting an expert from uh, from Rome to uh, collaborate with us when we were preparing the statement. Some of the interactions are outlined in the statement uh, at a diagrammatic level, uh, and the questioner can look at that and see how they see how they work. And you can see from that, and we will re we will relate to that in uh, again more later on. You can see from that how complicated and how diverse the actions of CBD are. What we need to know for CBD to be safe as a novel food is whether or not these interactions are significant at the doses that are planned. So we know that at the drug uses that uh, at the drug uses that, um, that, that that these studies are done at, the interactions occur. The question then comes: Do these interactions occur at the concentrations that are planned to be used out in the food? And that's the kind of interaction. That's the kind of information that we will need before we can decide whether or not CBD is safe as a novel food. Thank you, Harry. I think it's time to move on and uh, yeah, I think the floor is again yours so that you go through the presentation regarding gastrointestinal tract. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Thank you very much. In this section, what we want to do is we want to look individually at the biological systems where CBD we know has an, has an effect. Um, we're going to cover um, four levels quite, um, or three or four levels quite briefly, but then we're going to spend more time on the next section, which will be looking at the reproductive toxicity or potential reproductive toxicity of CBD. So for me, I am just going to look very briefly at uh, the effect of CBD on the GI tract. And if I could have the next slide, please. In many of the studies with epidiolex and with the higher concentrations of CBD, a side effect of CBD consumption has been diarrhea and nausea. And this has been serious enough in some of the um, epilepsy studies that patients have been withdrawn from the studies. We do not have any information on whether or not this occurs at the concentrations where this would be used as a novel food. And we do not have any studies where this has been addressed as an initial uh, critical effect of CBD. So that the data gap here is that we need to know whether or not CBD can cause diarrhea um, directly or whether or not it happens uh, through another pathway. So does diarrhea occur in people who are given CBD at lower doses? Why does it happen? What is the mechanism? It's important to understand that because there may be downstream consequences. And the most important point is, will it get worse with time or will it resolve itself? And that, I think, covers the last of my presentations. I can now pass over to uh, Dr. Inga Mangelsdorf, who will talk about the relationship between CBD and liver metabolism. Thank you. So the liver is an important target of CBD toxicity. So I will give you some examples. Please, can I have the next slide? So we have um, several studies on different animal species, including rats, mice, dogs, and rhesus monkeys, with up to 39 weeks duration. And we know that effects in the liver comprise increases in liver weight, hypertrophy of liver cells, increased levels of liver enzymes in plasma as indicators of liver toxicity. These include alanine transferase, aspartate amino transferase, alkaline phosphatase, gamma glutamyl transferase, and in addition also bilirubin was increased. All studies showed events even at the lowest dose level investigated, the low L, which was 10 milligram per kilogram body weight. No observed adverse effect level could be identified, which means, as already indicated, that this is a data gap. Next slide, please. So now I come to the available data in humans. So we have randomized control trials lasting four weeks in healthy volunteers and also in healthcare workers 
not taking medications that might interfere with CBD. But there are also many other studies with patients, mainly in patients with epilepsy. These involve concomitant medication and are therefore difficult to evaluate. Nevertheless, they show similar effects as the other studies. And as in animal studies, increases in liver enzyme levels and with lower frequency, increases in bilirubin was found. In several cases, these increases in liver enzymes met, made a discontinuation of the treatment necessary. So it was quite severe effects. Um, in most studies, a threefold increase of normal values was considered an adverse effect. Lower increases that may be toxicologically relevant for a novel food were not reported. As stated before, it's a difference between novel food evaluation and uh, an evaluation of a medicine. So lowest loyal based on this measure was 4.3 milligram per kilogram body weight in the study with healthcare workers. The NOIL may be considerably lower, taking into account the lack of reporting of weaker effects of a less than threefold increase. As in the animal studies, no NOIL could be derived. So again, we have here a data gap. Next slide, please. In this slide, I want to point to, to some me mechanistic aspects uh, relating to liver toxicity. Um, we have a study in mice, and in this study, gene expression of 84 genes related to liver toxicity was investigated. 22 were downregulated, 26 were upregulated. Effects were seen partly at dose levels tenfold lower than those causing classical liver toxicity. In this study, the genes affected were related to general liver toxicity, oxidative stress, lipid metabolism, cholestasis, and on top of it, metabolizing enzymes from the cytochrome P450 family and glucuronosyl transferases. The increases were up to thousandfold. Next slide, please. So, um, here I want to present to you that the liver really plays a central role in the toxicity of CBD. First, there is liver toxicity per se, as explained above. Secondly, the mechanistic study shows that based on its interactions with the cytochrome P450 genes, CBD can affect various um, aspects of metabolism within the body, endogenous metabolism such as sexual steroids, and thus may lead to reproductive toxicity. And in addition, changes of thyroid hormone metabolism can lead to thyroid toxicity. Both endpoints are affected, as you will see later on in one of the next presentations. And thirdly, the CBD affects drug metabolism through up and down regulation of drug metabolizing enzymes. You heard about it. As an example, a dose of 1,500 mg CBD per day inhibits, inhibits CYP1A2, which leads to increased half-life of caffeine and a two-fold higher plasma concentration of caffeine in the body. Next slide, slide, please. So in this slide, I will highlight the data gaps relating to the liver. So I mentioned them before to make it short, we do not have no else for liver toxicity, both in human and in animal studies. And we do not have no else for CBD drug interaction in human and animal studies. So there has something to be done. So now I want to give the floor to Karen Hirsch Ernst. She will deal with neurological problems and also with reprotoxicity. Inge, unfortunately, we're having a problem with the connection of Karen, so uh, Harry volunteered to go on. So please, Harry, the floor is yours. OK. OK, yes, I, I apologize to everyone. Uh, Karen uh, knows this literature much better than I do and is uh, a real expert in the area. However, since she's not available, I can uh, take you through um, the, the, uh, the, the data. Um, this is a really important part of the um, 
possible toxicity of CBD. And there has been a lot of studies that have been carried out with it, primarily because it's been used in clinical trials as an adjunctive epilept anti-epileptic drug. Um, and this is for um, refractory um, epilepsies and for patients with um, epilepsies such as lennox gastro or Dravet syndrome. And the studies have been carried out um, if you can show the next slide, please. The studies have been carried out at varying doses, going from 5 to 20 milligrams per kilogram per day, and they've also been used at higher concentrations as well. And although it's very effective as a drug, it also has a significant and wide ranging um, number of adverse effects, ranging from somnolence through sedation and lethargy, uh, and then up to things like aggression and sleep disorders. As we said at the beginning, this can be tolerated if we're talking about uh, using it as a drug that's going to have clinical advantage. These effects clearly could not be acceptable if we're talking about something as a novel food. Even at low concentrations, such as five milligrams per kilogram per day, we are getting these side effects so that we can derive no reliable, um, no adverse effects levels. In the next slide, please. There have been a few studies in healthy volunteers, but generally speaking, they've really involved only single ad administration of CBD and are of short term duration. And here again, adverse effects have been seen. So there are different ones, headaches, somnolence, nausea in some cases, which sometimes resolves and sometimes doesn't. And it means that what we've got is we have not been able to establish a reliable dose response relationship for neurological effects. These are clearly a problem and we need to be able to clarify these. Next slide, please. So when we're thinking about this and you think about the sort of the relationship between CBD and these uh, psychological outcomes, it's not really that surprising. When you look at the statement, we've got some information in there about the way that CBD works. Um, and you can see that there are numerous targets for it including the CB, the cannabinoid receptors, including the GABA receptors, 5-HT1 A and D2 receptors, all of which can interact both agonistically and antagonistically with CBD. And the extent to which the effect of the CBD uh, will have an outcome depends on the interplay between the receptors, the CBD dose, any other drugs that are being used, and that can include uh, drugs that are working through, CP, uh, through the cytochrome P450s, or directly neurological um, trans neurotransmitters, um, and on the duration and the time frame of use. So next slide, please. So what we need here is we need human data in healthy volunteers, long-term effects of repeated exposures, and testing of dose responses, different doses, so that we can actually derive or a, 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 an ident a, a no L, a no, no observed uh, effect level. And without this, it's very difficult for us to be able to be convinced about how safe um, uh, uh, CBD will be in relation to neurological effects. So at this stage, I think we've gone through some of the preliminary information and we can hand back to the chair for questions from the audience on these parts. OK, thank you, Harry. So just to clarify, any questions can be put in the chat at any time. Uh, previous sections, this section, just put them on the chat. Now, two of my colleagues are actually trying to um, make the questions visible to the audience, and I think they're working on that. On the meanwhile, uh, while they're working on publishing the questions, I have a question for Harry. Um, Harry, was the lack of diarrhea in animal studies considered, or it will be considered as evidence this effect may not occur at lower doses? The floor is yours, Harry. Thank you. Um, extrapolating from animal studies to uh, human data is always very, very difficult. Um, and it is going to be, uh, it, it, you, everybody will be aware that there are correction factors and differences in concentrations that you take into account 
when you are looking at the uh, the relationship between an, the effect of a food or a drug in a human uh, and in relation to, um, uh, to, to animal studies. So if it was overt and if it was one of the preliminary studies, then it would certainly provide background information. But whether or not we would be able to draw hard conclusions from that was something that would need to be studied more carefully. Thank you, Harry. Uh, one more question, and this time is for Inge. How is the reversibility of liver effects taken into account in the risk assessment and derivation of low L and no L? Inge, floor is yours. Um, yes, it is correct that uh, liver effects may be at least partly or in some cases reversible. But I think it's a different situation if you take CBD as a drug or if you take it as a food. Because in the case of a food, you have to consider that it may be a long term use. And under these circumstances, the reversibility does not play a role. So we cannot address it or we cannot take it into consideration. Okay. I think. Hello. So you pass it to me again. Um, I think we still have a little bit of time for questions. So there's another question published. If CBD ingredients get authorized without data protections, um, sorry, I'm just trying to read the whole question. Without data protection, preparation complying with the specifications will be allowed. Is there a certain flexibility in allowing very similar preparations that only slightly differ, or will those have to go through the whole procedure, be evaluated by EFSA, or will a faster authorization be possible? I think. There's uh, something going wrong here with the system because th this question um, actually does not uh, does not belong to this section. So I'm going to just hold on for this question for a little bit later when we probably can do it. Irini. Um, OK, I'll just move on. Um, so there's an additional question and I think this question has been from before. And the question is again for Harry. Are effects on the gastrointestinal system and psychological function considered to be adverse, meaning they could potentially drive the derivation of a NOL or upper intake limit? Or rather, are these considered minor potential side effects that should be considered by the consumer but are not truly adverse? I think you answered that question already in your presentation. Harry, the floor is yours. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I, th I think that it depends on the uh, it depends on the effect. I mean, for example, somnolence or uh, is something that would obviously be more harmful than a mild dose of diarrhea. I think what would happen is that when this is assessed by the panel, by the by the the experts, the decision would be made depending on the severity of the symptoms and the um, consequences that it may have for the individual. Uh, the, the it would be decided under those circumstances whether or not they would be adverse or whether they would be things that people could take into account. Um, yeah. I understand that question has actually been asked or and answered already. Sorry, back to you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Um, can I just ask my colleagues if there's any other questions on the chat that I am missing? Okay. Anna, I th there seems to be a delay. One. Yes, that's what I was expecting indeed. Um, <clears throat> but I see one more question in the published questions. The concerns regarding CBD and the liver were already established in such concern and concerns such as this addressed by was addressed by specific toxicological studies and data. What about these studies was not sufficient number of participants, length of study, etc. I believe uh, this is for Inge. Inge, please, the floor is yours. 
Yeah, that's an important question. Um, in fact, we have quite a number of studies on CBD, but um, they were focused on the use of CBD as a drug, where we take into consideration that maybe also adverse effects um, may occur in a balance to the positive effects, the desired effects. And um, as I mentioned already in my talk, our problem is that we do not have a dose without effects, both in humans and in animal studies. And that is the reason why we need um, additional studies. So we need to establish a NOAL, a safe dose level um, for use as a food. And perhaps to add, yes, um, we, we think about human studies um, with sufficient duration as already indicated to allow also to assure that there are no effects from accumulation with sufficient number of uh, participants and with suitable endpoints covering all the effects which uh, we are dis discussed up to now and with which we will discuss later on. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Inge, I have another question for you. Are in vitro pharmacology or toxicity studies using 3D cultures, e.g. liver tox using organotypics or organ on a chip system, accepted, I suppose it's accepted, in place of uh, or in conjunction with the classic in vivo tox data? So in in vitro data are quite useful for investigating modes of mechanisms of action. But um, when going further in our evaluation of um, possible harms of a substance, then we need um, studies in living species to to ascertain the complex interaction within the body between the different um, target organs and so on. And so I think, yes, um, in vitro studies are useful for metabolism and a lot of what we know about metabolism of C CBD also comes from uh, in vitro studies. But for our main data gap, um, the lacking NOELs, um, that's uh, not suitable. If if you allow me, uh, Inge, I'm going to give the floor to Jose that also wanted to add something about the question that we just received. Jose? Thank you, Anna. Uh, yes, uh, I want to, uh, to inform the audience uh, that we have recently launched a call uh, for uh, creating a system for the qualification of a uh, new approach methodologies, including organ on the chip. Uh, the intention from EFSA is to have a system for a qualification for fit for, for purpose of all these methodologies. As Inge was mentioned, these uh, are a replacement for the uh, in vivo methods, but can provide mechanistic information. So we will uh, the, the the call is open now. Is uh, all member states are, have been invited to submit proposals, and we expect in two three years to have a system to allow the developers of these uh, new approach methodologies to register the methodology in EFSA and to qualify for which uh, purpose these methodologies can be used in risk assessment for food and feed. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. I think Jose is trying to advertise his call. What it is for sure clear is that this is not yet fully implemented, but can be a complementary approach that EFSA is very much interested in further developing. I think I still have time for one or two questions more. Um, if there are any more questions. Um, I think there was a few interesting questions regarding human studies. Um, if I recall, since from before. OK, so no additional feedback. OK. I'm so, sorry. I'm so sorry, Anna. They are, they are published, but they just don't appear right away. So. Uh, yeah. OK, I'm so sorry. No, no. The, the joys of, of the remote meetings. 
Yes, I, I will uh, try again. Okay, seems like we have one. Okay, I will take this as the last question for this section. Um, Oh, no, this is the question we had before. It's about uh, um, data property and what is included in the <coughs> in the novel food um, regulation. So I think we should come back to this one, as I indicated before, because it's a very similar kind of question. <coughs> Ocean? Ah, one more. So what would be an acceptable time frame for repeat use uh, human trials to demonstrate no side effects. I suppose the question has to do time frame. What would be the duration of the studies? I guess this is the question that we are asking. And uh, I don't know who from the speakers would like to answer to this question. OK, can I make a guess? Harry, will you help me out? Thank yes. you. Yeah, um, it, it's a difficult question to answer, which is why nobody's in a big hurry. It's going to depend on the uh, question, the specific question that's being asked. Um, we know that um, CBD accumulates in animal studies over a considerable period of time. And some of the longer term studies that have been done with Epidiolex uh, also show similar effects. So we know that even in, in the some of the studies that have gone over more than a year can show that there are long term consequences of having epidiolex treatment over a longer period. So I think that what would have to happen is what the question is, um, is going to relate to um, the, uh, the the outcomes in relation to it being a food rather than a uh, rather than a drug. And I would think that we at the moment anyway, our um, uh, assessment is that a period of six months would be a would be adequate to answer most of the questions that we are concerned about. That may or may not vary depending on the specifics, but that is our starting position, if you like. OK, so I think it's time to move on and uh, our next speaker is actually my colleague Ocean. Ocean, the floor is yours. Thank, Thank you so you. much for stepping over. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my pleasure. Um, next slide, please. So I will be uh, walking you a bit through the endocrine and reproductive effects that we have um, found out during the um, uh, review of the literature that we found. We have some available evidence for effects on uh, the thyroid and the thyroid hormone system. Uh, in particular, we have a 20-week uh, oral toxicity study in the rat uh, showing uh, dose-dependent T4 decreases, increases in TSH and uh, thyroid follicular hypertrophy. Uh, and we also have a number of studies on the monkey, um, on monkeys, sorry, uh, showing changes in relative thyroid weights. Um, additionally, we have some evidence showing that CBD could affect the hypothalamo-pituitary gonadal axis. Um, meaning that in rodent and in semen models specifically, uh, CBD consumption has been associated with um, adverse effect on gonadotropins such as LH or FSH, as well as sex hormones uh, and mostly testosterone uh, with potential decreases in testosterone, as well as a few uh, um, studies on females showing effects on estradiol and progesterone. Uh, the major data gap that we have here for these effects is that uh, those endocrine effects have not been investigated in humans, so we do not have answers as for the effects in humans at all. Uh, next slide, please. As far as the reproductive system is concerned, we also have some available animal data uh, regarding developmental toxicity. Um, in utero exposure to epidiolex has shown uh, some effects in both the rats and the rabbits. We uh, have evidence of little loss, supernary liver lobes, uh, as well as reduced, fe reduced sorry, fetal waste. Uh, weights. Um, some toxicity has also been demonstrated on the reproductive tract. Um, uh, studies show alteration of reproductive organ weights and sizes, an impairment of spermatogenesis, uh, which could ultimately result in fertility impairment, and some histopalos 
histopathological changes on the testes and on the ovaries. Um, as far as fertility is concerned, it's been investigated uh, solely in males and exposure to CBD has been associated with a decrease in sperm quality at doses as low as 15 milligrams per kilogram body weight per day uh, and uh, associated as well with decreases in impregnation rates, number of litters, uh, of live pups in the litters as well, and that was in the mice. Now, uh, there are also potential effects on sexual behavior as well, uh, with one study showing latency to first mount in mice. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so as for the endocrine system, we have a number of data gaps regarding these effects uh, on reproduction uh, and actually um, mostly linked to the fact that we have very few animal studies available and absolutely no data available in humans. So that's a big question mark we have here as to whether these potential effects are also um, are also valid for humans. Uh, we have a particular lack of studies in females, which female reproduction is harder to to, um, to investigate in, in male reproduction, but still we need some answers there. And we have a lack of toxicity uh, studies at lower doses regarding reproductive effects. Uh, and I think that's it for reproduction, yes. Okay. Uh, I think Karen is actually now with us, right? Karen? Yes, <clears throat> yes, thank you. Sorry for the technical issues. No, eh, well, <laughs> it happens. <laughs> Karen, um, if you're with us and if I can, um, we I would just uh, take a few moments to have questions from the audience. If there's any questions that my colleagues would like to publish. OK, I think this is a question that we had received before, so Regarding reproductive effects, uh, studies in animals have reported conflicting results for most outcomes. Effects on testosterone, mating efficiency and sperm parameters. How were these discrepancies addressed? And is the conclusion that the effects are adverse or more so that more definitive data are needed for these endpoints mentioned negative effects on reproductive function? The floor is yours, Karen. Just give me a second so it will change the camera and uh, we'll go to you. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, now regarding this question, uh, indeed, it is a matter of um, having sufficient data to be able to evaluate the effects that have sporadically been seen in animal studies in different animal studies. So um, I think that rather than saying there might be conflicting results in animal studies, um, one should say these are indicators that uh, one should look very carefully on effects regarding the hormone system and also reproduction. And I would also like to emphasize that particularly regarding changes in hormone levels, um, of course, there are dynamics um, which are important here and uh, there are feedback loops, etc. But if we see changes in hormone levels, this is an indication that the hormone systems are responding to um, a stimulus or um, to um, a challenge. And so this needs to be taken seriously, particularly since we have absolutely no data in humans. I hope this helps. <laughs> Sorry, I was having problem to unmute myself. Um, <laughs> Karen, the next question is again for you, and it's what study or studies do you recommend to address the reproductive data gaps mentioned here? It depends on the reproductive endpoints. A general recommendation cannot be made. These are aspects that uh, might be discussed further in uh, technical meetings. But um, 
of course, one needs to consider that certain endpoints cannot be um, investigated in animals, uh, in, excuse me, in human studies. For example, teratogenicity or developmental toxicity. This would definitely be unethical. However, there are other parameters that couldn't, can quite easily be assessed and investigated in human studies. For example, hormone levels or sperm parameters. Karen, I would leave the camera at you and just uh, throw you another question um, from the chat. Can available retrotax studies in animals be leveraged or do we need separate studies for each CBD product? Well, this is actually a question pertaining to the composition of the CBD product and um, yeah, so I, I, I don't think this is a general question on reproduction or um, endocrine aspects. Indeed, Karen, we also had the question before so in a similar manner. Yeah. Um, it appears another question is it appears that tier one toxicology studies are unlikely to be sufficient. I guess we're meaning uh, for this particular effects, but um, maybe you can help me, Karen. Well, tier one toxicology studies um, encompassing genotoxicity in vitro studies or a 90 day rat study. Um, would not be sufficient in this regard. I mean, a 90-day rat study might provide some indications, for example, on thyroid effects, and we do see thyroid effects in the rat, indeed, in, subchron in a subchronic study, but um, otherwise these uh, studies do not provide information on developmental toxicity or um, do not provide sufficient information on um, comprehensive reproductive issues. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, one more. Uh, are the effects on the reproductive system reversible or not? This, Back to um, you, Karen. yes, thank you very much. Now, this is a question that would have to be investigated in detail. Um, we do know that uh, spermatogenesis is, is dynamic and uh, there may be aspects of reversibility, but in the end, uh, what we need is information on long-term studies, repeated dose studies in this respect. Good. Karen, I'm gonna keep you in the camera for one more okay. question. Uh, mm -hmm. So, could these changes in hormones be taken as an opportunity for new treatments rather than an adverse effect? Interesting question. <laughs> That's a very interesting question, but um, it depends on the perspective. If um, a substance is to be used as a drug, um, then certain effects might be um, used for beneficial purposes, but on the other hand, if the substance is being evaluated as a food, a novel food, um, we are responsible for assessing whether safe levels of use can be established. So it's two, parts, two sides of a certain metal uh, regarding endocrine effects. It depends on the dose of the substance, it depends on the duration of exposure, and it depends on the context of exposure. But again, I think we need to emphasize that we're looking at CBD not as a substance used for treatment for medical purposes, but as a food. Thank you very much, Karen. That was uh, very clear. OK, I think uh, we can move on. We may have some general questions at the end that we can. We're just uh, well, so we the general questions we'll take them at the the session in questions and answers. So I think I will move to our next speaker, which is Jose. Thank you, Jose. Thank you very much, Karen. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. If I can have the next slide.
So the next element while this, yeah. Uh, so one of the additional elements that is uh, obviously uh, linked uh, not only to this uh, CVD, but uh, all uh, application services by EFSA, including all applications on Nobel Foods, is uh, to address the presence of small particles, including nanoparticles. This is a mandate that uh, the European Commission decided to send to EFSA in 2019 that has been implemented with two guidance documents. Next slide, please. These two guidance documents were published in August last year. The first one, the guidance on technical requirements, covered the information that the applicant need to include in the dossier in order to address if uh, the material of the substance uh, require nanoscale assessment uh, for the safety uh, evaluation. This includes uh, materials that uh, have uh, nanoparticles and not well covered through the risk assessment process. And as uh, the second guidance, that is the update of the previous one, in case that the nanoscale risk assessment is needed, the second guidance, the guidance on nano risk assessment, provide all the elements that need to be followed up by the applicant in order to ensure that the safety assessment uh, include all these nanoscale considerations. Next slide, please. Let's start with the first guidance, the guidance on particle technical requirements. This guidance offer different appraisal routes that the applicants need to follow in order to demonstrate that the conventional risk assessment, the typical one not include nano considerations, is sufficient. The first uh, appraisal route covers solubility and dissolution rate to demonstrate that consumers could not be exposed to small particles. The second part uh, on particle size distribution to demonstrate that even if the material have particles, the particles are large particles, not at the nano scale. And the third one is uh, the coverage of the existing studies. The applicant may decide to demonstrate that yes, uh, the material include a fraction of small particles, including nanoparticles, but do is a, a fraction of small particles is well covered by the existing safety studies. Its appraisal route uh, is independent, so demonstrating that uh, there is a fulfillment of the criteria for one appraisal route should be sufficient. Next slide. Let's try to adapt this uh, specific uh, consideration to, to CVD. CVD is a lipophilic, uh, a small organic uh, molecule, as a consequence uh, appears as uh, particles. So the first element is to check if uh, the particles are at the nanoscale. So basically, if, if there is a significant fraction of nanoparticles in the material. And this requires the assessment of each individual um, application, each individual material uh, may have different particle size distribution. It's important to mention that even if the uh, novel food is marketed in the lipophilic media, additional information is needed. It should be demonstrated by the applicant that there is a full solubilization and that there is a real solubilization of the material, not a dispersion of particles. In case that uh, the consumers uh, ingest uh, particles, the next step is to see what's happened with these particles in the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, this uh, material may dissolve in the gastrointestinal tract, uh, but also may have the capacity to reach uh, the intestine as particles. And for lipophilic material, we expect at least partial uh, um, uh, dissolution, but uh, we need to, to, to check if the dissolution is sufficient to cover the full material. One in the intestine, the next step is what's happened with the uh, epithelia, with the cells that uh, cover the intestine. Uh, the, uh, these cells have the capacity to update nanoparticles, so it's important to know if the material, the absorption of uh, CVD is as a normal lipophilic uh, molecule or as particles that obviously include a huge amount of molecules in each particle. And in case that there is uptake of the particles by the cells, these uh, particles may be also distributed to other organs. If uh, there is a confirmation that uh, there the are particles uptaken by the cells and distributed systematically uh, to the other organs, then uh, so, uh, you, you can uh, move uh, Anna to the next slide. So in case that there is a confirmation that there are particles uptaken by the cells and also that may be distributed to the other organs, the safety assessment must consider and integrate these nanoscale considerations. Again, we are expecting that part of the material may be dissolved, but if there is a significant part of the material is still at particles, that's trigger an assessment according to the EFSA scientific committee guidance for nano risk assessment. And there are some elements uh, to be considered by the applicants. 
For example, in the case of the genotoxicity, the uh, gene mutation uh, te standard test, AIMS test, is not suitable for these uh, particles, so need to be complemented with a, a mammalian gene mutation uh, in vitro test. So the, we need to have two different and complementary mammalian cell uh, in vitro tests, uh, negative both, in order to confirm uh, the lack of uh, genotoxicity concerns. For the ADMES studies, the OECD test uh, uh, guidelines is uh, not really appropriate. So the suggestion is to include a satellite, a satellite group to investigate ADME for these uh, nanoparticles in the 90-day studies. The other uh, toxicity tests uh, conducted at, through the OECD guidelines need to be adapted according to the EFSA scientific guidance. So there is a, a need to adapt all the toxicity testing in order to be sure that the, 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 the safety assessment will address consumers exposed to particles. Additional element for a lipophilic material like a CBD is that the, if the test in the toxicity test, the material has been dissolved in the lipid matrix, then the results inform on the toxicity of the chemicals, but not necessarily on the nanoscale considerations. And finally, the guidance uh, from the EFSA uh, suggests the use of integrated approaches to testing and assessment and new approach methodologies to minimize the need for uh, conducting additional animal testing. Next slide. If uh, you want to have more information on how to address particle sites, uh, obviously my recommendation should be to read the guidance, but also we organized uh, two months ago a stakeholder workshop. You have here the link with the presentation, video recording, and frequently asked questions related to the assessment of uh, nanoparticles. Thank you. There's always this problem with the button of the mute. This thing of doing it live is tough, huh? I have to say. Um, so, Jose, thank you very much. I have two questions um, for you already uh, the, from the chat, so from the attendees. The first one is, could you please confirm that assessment of nanoparticles is not required for products obtained as oily products? and is required only for products obtained as powder and then diluted in oil. Floor is yours, Jose. Thank you. And no, I do not confirm. Uh, uh, I do not confirm. What we need is to have uh, information on the particles. So if the uh, extraction is an oily product, uh, there is a need to be sufficient information to demonstrate that there is no dispersion of particles in the product. So there are recommendations in the guidance on uh, how to which kind of information uh, must be uh, presented, but it's essential to demonstrate that uh, there are no particles at the, in, in the product. Uh, it's impossible to distinguish a solution from the dispersion if the particles are, are at nanoscale. So we need to have a analytical verification. Jose, I'm going to keep you in the camera and um, you have an, a second question. Um, does the criteria of above 33.3 grams per liter for water solubility also apply for fat soluble? And the answer again is no. This is the criteria for solubility in water. In the case, uh, and it's a link that uh, the majority of the cells, uh, obviously in the human body and the animal body are by water, so they are lipophilic. Uh, uh, the, the partition in the li lipophilic media in the cells uh, is uh, th does not cover the same uh, volume. So the question is that there is no a specific criteria for uh, solubility in lipids. If the material is, uh, for example, the noble food is uh, this, uh, dissolved in uh, lipophilic media. Again, this uh, they need to be demonstrated that there is full solubilized. And in the case that there are particles or the consumers ingest particles uh, in the uh, lipophilic media, the solubility in the, uh, in the lipid should be compared with the toxicokinetics. So it should be demonstrated that the concentration in all the organs in the lipid fraction is below the level of solubility in lipids in order to be sure that the material is solubilized and is present as molecules and not as particles. Jose, we have a follow-up question, um, so stay on the camera, please. Can you please confirm that OECD 116 guideline can be, as, can be used for the assessment of solubility in oil? And again, sorry, but I'm say, I need to say again, no. 
we try to see when uh, drafting the technical guidance if we can uh, use the OECD uh, 116 uh, test guidelines, but uh, at the end we conclude that it's not feasible for nanoparticles. Uh, you need to remember that most of the OECD guidelines uh, were not developed for nanomaterials. There is uh, now a process in the OECD to adapt all test guidelines uh, to be able to address uh, nanoparticles, but this uh, will take uh, years. So for the moment, there is no OECD test to measure the solubility. You need to consider what is the solubility and then to address uh, the uh, concentration expected in the different lipids uh, in the media, in the, uh, in the in vitro or in vivo studies. Jose, I keep you there for one more question. So if data demonstrates CBD in powder form has no nanoparticles, will evidence need to be provided to demonstrate no nanomaterials present if mixed into oil, e.g. MCT? If this is a requirement, it would not be in line with prior novel food applications. That's a comment. So the question is, um, can you read it? Are you? Yes, I can read it. and. Uh, uh, I can answer the, if the, there is sufficient data to demonstrate that there are no, the, in the power there are no nanoparticles according to uh, uh, criteria with this uh, less than 10% of the particles with a size less than 500 nanometers who so have a, a, a size less than 250 uh, nanometers. If uh, this criteria is met, then uh, obviously there is uh, no need to address uh, additional elements for uh, the uh, nano considerations because the material uh, is, uh, is is not covered. One key element is the methodology to for measuring this, uh, the, the particle size distribution, and there are specific recommendations in the guidance, and there are also methods that cannot be used. So be, because what we need is the size of the constituent particles, not of their agglomerates because consumers will be exposed to the to the specific particles. But if uh, according to the methods uh, that are indicated in the technical guidance, uh, there is a demonstration that the criteria is met and all particles are larger, uh, there is no need for additional nanoscale considerations. Okay, so I think we don't have any more follow up questions. Thank you very much, Jose. And I would then uh, it takes a bit of time to come the camera to me, but here I am. So I'm just going to introduce the next speaker. That's Catalina Manio, who's our colleague in the front desk and workforce planning unit here at EFSA. Please, Catalina, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, thank you all uh, for joining. I'm Catalina, uh, scientific officer of uh, front desk uh, workforce planning. And I will give you a short presentation on the experiences on the suitability check on CBD as uh, novel foods applications. So next slide, please. What is the suitability check? Uh, it is a thorough check of the dossier where we ensure that the information and documents provided by the applicant are in line with the novel food regulation as well as with uh, the specific requirements established in the EFSA administrative and scientific guidelines. This check is comprised within the validity check performed by the European Commission, who consults EFSA on the suitability of the data. It is part of the first stage of the life cycle of the application in EFSA performed before the risk assessment starts. Uh, it is during the risk assessment phase when the information of the application will be assessed by the experts to provide a sound scientific advice uh, to the risk managers, um, that is the European Commission, who, who will finally take uh, uh, the decision on the authorization of the novel food. Next slide, please. So for this check, EFSA has 30 working days to provide uh, its views to the European Commission. Uh, and then if um, the European Commission uh, can be uh, con can contact the applicant to provide the outcome of the validity check. In case uh, EFSA considers the data is not suitable for its uh, evaluation, uh, for its uh, risk assessment, EFSA will communicate this outcome to the European Commission who may contact the applicant to request further information. Now for dossiers submitted after the implementation of the transparency regulation as of the 27th of March of 2021, additional checks have been uh, implemented during the suitability uh, check phase. 
One is the administrative um, confidentiality check, where we ensure that the documents have been correctly sanitized by the applicant and um, so to prevent the um, publication of sensitive information. I will come back to this point in my next uh, slide. Uh, the second one corresponds. Oh, please before. <laughs> thank you. Uh, the second um, check corresponds to the verification of notification of studies obligation to ensure that all the studies that were commissioned or carried out after the 27th of March of 2021 have been duly notified to EFSA database before its starting date. To learn uh, more information and to, to have practical um, uh, inputs, you can consult the administrative guidance um, for the preparation of applications on novel foods and the EFSA practical arrangements that are all available in EFSA website. Next slide. In this slide, uh, I will show you an overview of um, the main gaps and deficiencies found in the applications uh, we have checked so far in FTP, uh, which may serve as a guide for new or under preparation dossiers. So after the stability check of more than 40 applications that we have received, we have found recurrent issues uh, of missing data. In the first place, in identity, um, it is key that the applicant clearly identify the novel uh, which will be placed on the market. Once this is clear, then the applicant should prepare the dossier following the EFSA's administrative and scientific guidelines. Uh, for example, sometimes the identity of the novel food itself is not clear enough, whether it is um, a simple mixture, a complex mixture, uh, the formulation also sometimes is not uh, uh, clear, whether it is a powder, crystal or an oil. Um, so if the applicant has any doubts, we recommend you uh, to directly contact the European Commission um, who can um, uh, clarify and help them to define the novel food before building the dossier. On the other hand, uh, information the identity of the raw material is very important, like uh, geographical location, taxonomy, and also the verification of the identity according to international methodologies. Um, which usually is very scarce in the applications. So the applicant um, should follow the requirements that are established in another guidance, that is the guidance on botanical preparations for use of ingredients as a food supplement, um, as well indicated in the novel food guidance. Now, regarding the uh, production process, we have noticed that several dossiers uh, present very general description of the production process with poor information on how the raw material is converted to the novel food. For example, information on different treatments and conditions applied during the process, uh, the extraction methods, if any, the purification steps and the concentration of the final product, among others. Other important information is about the use of solvents and um, the, the identity which solvents are used and the ratio of use of them. Uh, next one. Uh, likewise, in the compositional information of the novel food is crucial also for its characterization. The applicant must provide data on all different components of the novel food and their quantities. We have received um, some dossiers where only the 10% of the novel food has been characterized, leaving great uncertainties for the uh, remaining 90%. About uh, the stability, uh, usually the tests do not cover the proposed uh, shelf life of the novel food, leading to additional questions and requests for uh, justification uh, for these deviations from the guidance. Um, in other cases, the applicant does not even propose the concrete shelf life as the time and condition of storage. So this is very important as well for the characterization. Uh, next one. Um, uh, and uh, just uh, a small reminder, as uh, our colleague uh, uh, Jose said, uh, now it is very important that uh, the information on uh, the presence of small, small particles are uh, demonstrated 
uh, following the specific requirements of the EFSAS guidance. The specifications here again, it is important that uh, the applicant clearly define the novel food, uh, so it can list all the specifications to, of the novel food to be placed on the market. Then uh, the proposed uses uh, sometimes is not clear either, uh, whether it is an ingredient, a supplement, and where are the full categories that it is intended to be used. Um, and finally, uh, the next uh, one, Anna, thank you. Uh, finally, uh, there are um, issues regarding the presentation of confidential documents that we have detected in dossiers uh, submitted after the transparency regulation implementation. Uh, such as the non-confidential version of the documents, meaning the public version. Um, even if it is sanitized, uh, the sanitization can be removed or can be copied. The information below can be copied. Uh, this means that the sanitization is not permanent, so uh, we need to go back to the applicant to uh, ensure that uh, this is uh, corrected. Um, sometimes we also have uh, problems where the confidential information is not highlighted in the confidential document uh, or both version, the confidential or non-confidential, uh, is different while they should be the same, only with this difference on the presentation of the information. One uh, document should be highlighted, the confidential information, and the other one sanitized. This is the only difference that we should find in both documents. And then there is a very sensitive point, that is uh, the protection of personal data of natural persons that usually is not sanitized. Um, and uh, it is um, referring to name, names, addresses and signatures of natural persons. Uh, next one. In parallel, in FTP, we are responsible for replying to the different questions received through our platform uh, Ask a Question. Since already one year, we have received around 60 queries on CBD, where more or less 80% of them corresponds to the um, global food area. Uh, one is uh, how can I get, um, one of the most uh, recurrent one, is um, how can I get the authorization of, uh, for an over food? And uh, the first step is to um, clarify with the, with the commission, of course, whether they need an authorization for the product, and then applicants can uh, build a dossier um, with the relevant information, documents, and workflows uh, for uh, the novel food applications that are available in the dedicated section in the EFSA website. Next one, please. And then, again, the, another very uh, regular question we receive, it is, uh, is my product a novel food? And here again, this is a question uh, that relates to the definition of a novel food that is established in the novel food regulation. And it has to be um, addressed directly to the European Commission. And next one. Finally, I would like to uh, make reference to our EFSA catalogs uh, of support initiatives during the life cycle of applications, where applicants can find different ways to interact and communicate with EFSA. I highlight here two, uh, sorry, five different initiatives available uh, during the two phases previous to the risk assessment. The first one is the pre-submission phase, as it is, uh, as the title says, it aims to support applicants before they submit a dossier. And here the applicant has the possibility to request uh, general pre-submission advice, uh, to pose a question via our dedicated tool, ask a question, the EFSA web form. And uh, for SMEs, they have the possibility to request administrative support. Next one. Once the application is received in EFSA and uh, the suitability check starts, applicants may ask EFSA for a teleconference to clarify EFSA request during the suitability check. Therefore, I leave you all invited to consult our catalog of uh, initiatives to find out more um, about other initiatives uh, that might be of your interest. And the last one, uh, last but not least, we have uh, launched a new LinkedIn group, uh, EFSA support to applicant, where you can find different information and um, support material um, dedicated to applicant. So to join the group, you can follow the link or uh, directly search us in, in the app. 
Thank you very much and uh, for your attention and back to you, Juana. Thank you very much, Catalina. Um, your last slides were actually something that I really wanted to say, is that um, this info session is just one of the tools that EFSA has to engage uh, with different stakeholders, and in particular what comes to service to future applicants. So Catalina just uh, summarized uh, that the possibilities in, in the before an application is submitted are in fact three. Um, and, and she has included that on her slide. But there's also a possibility to have clarifications teleconference even during the suitability um, check. And I would invite if, um, if part of our attendees are future applicants to take full advantage of those possibilities. OK, I think we don't have specific questions for Catalina, not at this stage. They, they will all come through Ask EFSA or in the LinkedIn group that she announced. But uh, we do. So I, what I would suggest is we are a little bit ahead of time, which I guess nobody minds if we finished our meeting a little bit earlier. And uh, and I just go for this for the next section, yeah. which is in fact general yeah. questions. Okay. 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 I have someone with the microphone on. Irini, I think that's you. It's Sorry, it's the room. <laughs> it's fine. Okay. Um. So I I think I had a first. I don't see the questions published yet. Huh? Uh, OK, there are. Here comes the first one um, is what study design type would be recommended for human studies? And I think I will give this question to Inge. Inge, can you please take it on? Thank you. So I have to say I'm not really an expert in human studies. But I can say a little bit what we discussed already, but it's still in the stage of development what we think what we need. So we, we need really a human study with sufficient sensitivity on different endpoints, as I reported before, for example, for the liver enzymes. So this sensitivity involves a sufficient number of um, participants and um, that would mean that we need for the critical endpoints a power calculation beforehand really to see what size of effects which we want to detect are detectable. And then the, the endpoints which we want to cover, you can derive from what we have said now in, in all our talks. Um, it starts with, um, with ADME, so we really want to know about um, the levels of, of uh, CBD in, in plasma at different time points um, of the study and also of relevant metabolites to being to, to be able to align the effects also with the CBD levels. And then the endpoints to be covered are starting with liver enzymes, liver toxicity, and um, go on um, on um, um, neurological effects, then we want to cover gastrointestinal at least. And then we have the um, reprotox effects where we know that we many of those cannot study in a human study, but we can assess hormone levels and many other endpoints. So we, we are sure or we are admitting rather that this will be a very complicated study and a huge study but we hope that this really will help us to understand what is going on with uh, CBD. And what I forgot to mention before, it is really important for us that we have several dose levels and then in the end we can establish a NOIL, which allows us then the um, evaluation. But maybe some of the others um, um, have um, some endpoints which I forgot to mention, but um, so from my side, that's what I can tell to this question. I'm taking the floor again. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to add anything to this question. I would just like to repeat what we said before that um, Inge explained as well that 
there are a series of considerations were still being made and and of course there are other ways that we could um, have a further uh, considerations on this matter on a stage of app, at the state of application so pre-submission advice is something we could consider does anybody want to add anything else OK, so I have a next question on. Oh, sorry, I see the floor on Harry. Harry, um, you're muted. Yeah, sorry, I, 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 I didn't want to uh, answer directly. Yeah, I think you covered most of it. Um, I think the other point that's important to consider is that um, studies that have been done uh, have been shorter term and we need long term data. So um, we've been considering that at some length, what constitutes long term data. And I think that uh, data over a six month period is probably would answer most of the serious questions that we have or the serious concerns that we have. Um, but as she said, I think that the outline in the, in, the, uh, in the statement will give you a fairly good idea about what about what is needed. And of course, that can be discussed uh, with the EFSA staff and secretariat. Thank you very much, Harry. Thank you. Uh, I'm just yeah. I'm just going to continue picking up the questions that my colleagues have already published on the question and answers chat. So and the next one uh, I believe is how applicable are the Epidolex clinical data to novel food applicants? Maybe Anna Maria can do that. Yes, I, I can take this, but of course, uh, Harry Inge or Karen are really welcome to intervene. Uh, well, as a uh, came out from uh, the presentation previously done. Uh, many studies with Epidiolex has been conducted with uh, uh, in um, patients uh, using adjunctive drugs and uh, um, with very high doses. And even when they were compared with healthy volunteer, the doses were pretty high. So one of the major gaps that we actually do have uh, is that uh, the human studies available uh, do not allow the to derive an OL uh, because uh, the uh, exposure is uh, quite, I mean, the, the doses are uh, quite high and do not allow to do that. So we do not, we, we see effect uh, at any of the available study of, uh, at particularly of Epidiolex. Uh, I don't know if Harry, Inge, Karen would like to add anything. No, I think you've covered it. I think that that's pretty much the situation. So. Uh... I have nothing actually to add. say. Also, the studies with Epidiolex are in patients mainly, and we have really a lack of study with normal people. As I said, for the for the liver bits, only one study with really volunteers and one study with healthcare workers who seem to rather normal people and not diseased one. And uh, when considering a food, then that's a different situation. Thank you very much. Um, I think I have one more question. Well, I have a few more questions in here. Is there a difference in EFSA assessment between synthetic CBD and natural CBD? Um, Irini, I'm going to actually ask you to do that one. Can you please? Of course. Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending. So, yeah, um, I would say there are, as for every novel food, we will have uh, here um, a synthetic and natural uh, CBD products, which will be assessed each one um, separately. This means uh, that uh, uh, the identity of the novel food, the production process, composition, uh, will be assessed for each dossier uh, that we will receive. And we are expecting uh, that uh, production process, meaning uh, synthetic process, versus extraction from natural products uh, products will have an impact on the final product. So we are expecting that uh, synthetic process will involve a starting material, uh, then a reaction, um, uh, then the formation of the product, the wanted product and byproducts. Also, it may lead to uh, some um, residual solvents or reagents. So those are things that need to be uh, 
are clearly addressed in an application. Then, of course, uh, if the applicant will follow another route, so we'll uh, get CBD from a natural source, from a cannabis sativa plant, then uh, we are expecting again to have um, a more complex mixture if uh, there would will, uh, not be any um, purification process, so other compounds uh, may be present in the final product, also their uh, residual solvents, so everything should be well documented um, for each dossier. Uh, so yeah, uh, we, we are expecting to have differences between the synthetic and natural uh, CBD products and uh, each of them will be assessed separately. Thank you. Thank you, Rini. Um, I think I have a little bit of a delay on the on the publication, at least on my computer. I don't know if other people are already able to see it, but my next question, I think we already answered to this previously. Oh, no, no, they, I got them. So the next question is actually uh, singling you out, Harry, is when considering designing a human safety study, what length of time is considered long term? I think we answered this one previously, but maybe you can just clarify. Yeah, as I said, we we have um, um, discussed this at some length, and at the moment, uh, our consider consideration is that six months constitutes a long term study. Some of the studies that have been done with Epidiolex, especially those in America, have looked at patients um, over a longer period than that, over two years, for example. Um, and uh, and in some sense, we, could, we we may be able to obtain data from that, but we run into the same problem. We're talking about Epidiolex. In clinical in a clinical um, uh, setting, so it's very difficult to extrapolate data from that to normal humans, and also, of course, critically, to extrapolate from being a medicine to being a food. Um, but at this stage, I think um, six months should give us the length of time that we need to find out whether or not there are chronic effects. Um, in the end, there may need to be post-market monitor, uh, monitoring put in place, but that's well beyond the stages that we're at at this at this time. I hope that helps. Thank you. Um, this, the following question is to Anna Maria, and it's with the exception of a few epidiolex studies, the data are from older and or non-guideline studies. Will a new guideline study be considered definitive to derive a point of departure? Um, E.g., will they supersede previous indicators of concern if these effects are not observed in new studies? And the floor is yours. Yes, but I have to unmute, of course. <laughs> so, uh, yes, indeed. Um, well, at the moment, uh, we uh, do not refer to any specific guidance because uh, uh, we do not have a specific guidance to refer on. Uh, as you were, as we were uh, mentioning before, uh, we do have a pediolex study which quite a high doses of CBD. Uh, we need to uh, have data on uh, lower exposure to CBD to see whether we do have, uh, we, we can, uh, you know, not observe the, the effect for which uh, the experts do have uh, concerns. And uh, yes, of course, if this can be demonstrated, we'll oversee the, uh, and we'll address all the data gaps. And uh, uh, of course, uh, the expert will evaluate them and uh, will take into consideration in the risk assessment. Uh, Harry, I don't know if uh, someone of uh, the experts would like to add anything on this. If I may, if I may, that's a good answer and a comprehensive one, but I would point out that just because the epidiolex studies are older doesn't necessarily mean that the results that they generated are um, uh, incorrect. So I think that what we need to do is we need to make sure that the, uh, the, the new studies are powered properly and the statistics and the analysis has been done correctly. So uh, we will look at the new data on its, on its, on its merits and analyze it on its merits and, uh, and then we will be able to compare it to the previous data. Thank you. 
Okay, I'm taking the floor again and the next uh, question is, um, I th think for Harry, is there any evidence with regards to the interactions between CBD and the microbiome? Um, yes, thank you. Um, I know there have been studies done in animals, various animals and um, animal models, um, and I think the data are interesting. Um, but given how little we understand about the interaction of the microbiome and normal physiology, I think trying to um, extrapolate from animal studies to humans is definitely not possible. And given the variation in the microbiome in different individuals, I think it would be very difficult to um, be able to come to any conclusions about CBD and the safety of the microbiome. However, I think the studies would be very well worthwhile doing. I think they're probably at the level of the research lab at the moment, um, but if data were generated and could be used in a presentation, it would certainly be taken um, very seriously. And if it would help us understand the safety of CBD, that would also be very useful. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. So I have a question here for Catalina, which she was uh, kind enough to answer in the chat, but maybe she can explain this to, to us all. Does the status intake in the EFSA register of questions means that the application is in the suitability check period? Catalina. Thank you. Yes, the intake phase uh, corresponds to the first uh, phase of the of the life cycle of the application and starts when EFSA receives the application from the European Commission um, and it uh, ends when the application is uh, validated by the European Commission. In between uh, this time that's been uh, in EFSA is uh, for the suitability check. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catalina. Next question, and maybe Anna Maria can take it. Will the statement on CBD have an impact on other cannabinoid novel food applications where much less data is available? C CBG, CBC? Anna, please. Uh, well, this uh, is a very complicated question because, I mean, this cannot be replied until uh, this uh, cannabinoid uh, will be under assessment. Uh, so it will depend on uh, whether they will be uh, provided alone in mixtures uh, together with CBD. Of course, if it's a kind of mixture, to get mixture together with CBD, this will have an impact. The CBD statement will have for sure an impact, uh, but still it's uh, very, very difficult difficult to say something before uh, we will dig into data composition and uh, also available data for what concerns the tox. But for, of course, I mean, those are cannabinoids, so we have uh, to, to take uh, them into, to take into consideration uh, also the you know, like like it was explaining explained during the presentation, their interaction with the cell signalings and different receptors. Thank you, Anna. Um, I I have another question, which I'm not so sure if I would should uh, give it to Catalina, but I think so. How will new request dossier not yet valid? be treated versus dossier already valid at the same time or after first opened, first treated. It actually comes more to us because this is after you've conducted your validation, right, Catalina? Yes, <laughs> okay. I guess so. Yeah, I think so as well. So Anna Maria, would you like taking it? You're muted, can you, No, yeah, sorry. Can you just repeat, Anna? Because I, I was. Uh, yeah, sorry. How will <laughs> new. Re no problem. How will new request dossier not yet valid be treated versus dossier already valid at the same time or after? First opened, first treated. So do they go in a line, all the dossiers, or what happens? 
Well, uh, the dossier will be evaluated uh, when they will be uh, um, when when we will receive them, and uh, of course, it depends very much from the data that are, are available, and uh, for uh, the additional data uh, requests that we will have. So uh, it's uh, not a matter of first come, first treated, but is a matter of how uh, full and uh, um, you know how. Um, Substantial are the data that has been submitted by the applicant and how many data uh, EFSA will eventually need to request before performing the risk assessment. I think if I can complement that, we do our best uh, to work in many dossiers in simultaneous and, uh, and in fact, I think we've been very good at that. Um, but we've as uh, Anna just explained, first the validation has to be completed and, and the experts start almost straight away working on it and finding if there's a, more data being requested. So uh, I have one more question. Um, is it possible to have the methodology of literature analysis? Oops, I have a thing here in front. Um, EFSA requires all information for app from applicants for a novel food application. Here we have any few informa many few information on the data considered as pertinent by EFSA. Can you take this one to introduce the systematic review coming? Uh, I think the question is really about can we have the methodology? Can we have the results of the literature review? Is that the question? I think. I'm trying to to understand the question, but Anna, maybe you can help me. Or Ocean, yeah. please. Oh no, I was going to give the floor to. Yes, that's the question. I think you 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 were right. So Anna can reply. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, I think that uh, with the systematic review that uh, we will be published or this information will be given, uh, it should be noted that the systematic review is uh, related uh, uh, only to uh, human studies and uh, only uh, with the CBD, uh, which has uh, uh, quite a high level of purity. Uh, so all this information will be later on uh, given uh, to the applicants and to the public. Uh, Harry, would you like to add anything? Uh, no, I think that covers it, except for the fact that the uh, the animal data was done by a, a narrative review um, rather than a systematic review, but nonetheless, it's a very comprehensive one covering all the databases that we would commonly use. If anybody has any literature that um, would give us any extra information, of course, we would be more than happy to receive it. Yes, yes, indeed. Thank you very much. The next question um, is from Jerome. It's actually a little bit outside our remit, uh, Jerome, because uh, what you're asking is about regulatory frameworks for the different products, while what we do in EFSA is strictly assessing the, the safety of these products within the, the framework of the novel food regulation. But uh, while we were looking at the question, uh, my colle our colleagues from the EC had actually uh, offered volunteers to provide an answer. So thank you very much, Takis. Would you, the floor is yours. Uh, Takis is a colleague in Unit E1 uh, that deals with novel food regulation at the European Commission, DG Sante. Takis? Yeah, good afternoon. I don't know what's going on with my camera, but it doesn't seem to be behaving. So I hope I'm putting it on. To, uh, can you see me now? I still see myself, but right. uh, maybe it's changing. Um, yes, the, the question on labeling. Obviously, uh, I think the participants should be aware that labeling uh, considerations really come after the risk assessment and it's really subject to obviously the Commission reviewing the EFSA assessment and the opinions and discussing potential uh, risk management, additional risk management measures of the member states. The key, however, is uh, in the case of labeling for intermittent type of dosers, I think uh, we consider the basis for our assessment, for the basis for risk management to be a risk assessment from EFSA that considers continuous intake of this on a chronic basis. Why is that? 
because we know that even if there is labeling that says that consumers should take this for 30, 40, 50 days and then stop and restart, uh, consumers may not follow that. So we really need to have a very, very solid basis uh, on the risk assessment that says that this is safe on a continuous and chronic intake type of situation. And then if indeed the applicant proposes that type of dosage, that we would discuss with the member states and possibly propose that type of, uh, of intakes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Takis. Um, OK, I think we're 10 minutes to the end and um, the next question, I don't know, we'll check again. So the next question we have is about how does the statement impact on current CBD applications? Will this mean no CBD authorizations are likely in the near future? I, my colleagues will allow me to try and answer to that one um, as responsible for the unit. Um, I think what the panel needs before expressing um, their opinion on the safety of these products is to have sufficient data to ensure that the safety of the consumers is ensured. So this is the this is the main principle on which ESO operates. The question of time is, as you can imagine, less relevant, although by no means irrelevant to our commercial operators and to the innovation that we want to promote in the European market. But our main concern is safety. So first of all, we would need that data to be able and please note that in no way we are saying there is a risk we're saying we're not able to evaluate the risk so without more data and this is i think a, a long answer to um, a quite straightforward question which i appreciate um, it would be difficult to answer to that question i, I there is no timing is about providing having the sufficient data that we can produce. What we can assure you from the side of EFSA is that we will continue working very hard as we've been working so far with our panel of experts. And as Harry already said, we count on the public as well for contributing to this, to the success of these studies and that, that we reach a final uh, decision, a final opinion. Harry, you have been very much uh, leading the, the work in the Novel Food Working Group. I don't know if you want to add anything to my statement. No, I, I think you've covered that very well. Thank you. OK, um, do I think we have one more question and then I think I'm going to wrap up and close. Uh, I don't see the question. Oh, yes, it is here. Um, in general, what is your opinion regarding the 70 milligram CBD per day for products on the market during the ongoing novel food process in UK? Is it safe and has it any effect? Harry, I'll give you the floor on this one. Thank you. Um, the question is an interesting one. The 70 milligrams per day is derived from the Committee of Toxicology, as I understand it. Um, and I think in their documents, they conclude that 70 mg per day does have effects. Um, it is not without effects, but that the effects are undefined, but probably at this stage not toxic. But it is a pragmatic decision rather than a decision strictly on food safety. And I think it is done because of the fact that there is it's, it's a response to the fact that these things are on the market and so they have to deal with it. Whether or not that will continue after the ACNFP uh, draws its conclusions, um, I don't know. I think that will be up to the Food Standards Agency. For those who don't know, the ACNFP is the Advisory Committee for Novel Foods and Processes and has taken over the role that EFSA previously uh, played during um, before Brexit. Um, just in case of just in case of openness, I am a member of that committee, but I'm not involved in any way in the discussions on CBD. So I have no idea where they are in those discussions and we will have to wait and see what the outcome is. I hope that answers the question. Thank you very much, Harry. OK, 
Um, so I have one more question and thank you very much for reminding me that I said that we would take this question later on and I had already forgotten. It's too much multitasking on my side, but thank you very much. So can you kind can you address the question data about data exclusivity? Are successful applications held confidentially? For a period of time. Um, the question about um, data exclusivity, it, it's actually enshrined in the novel food regulation. And because it is a regulation, we are risk assessors, not policy makers. I'm actually going to ask for the contribution of Rafa, another of my colleagues in the Digisante E1 unit, uh, which, who's been working for a long time in this regulation. He can explain better. Rafael, thank you so much. Hello, uh, good, yes, hello, good afternoon. I hope everyone can see me and, and yeah, I think if I understand correctly the, the question, so I mean, first of all, it's an applicant choice. So if a new studies, for example, are submitted in support of an application and claim as proprietary and the new studies have been sponsored, for example, by either a consortium or any other, you know, companies, you know, the granting of the data protection are as part of the authorization. And we cover both. I mean, the, the the data provided by the individual applicant plus the one representing, you know, the consortium. But again, this is up to the applicants to decide, you know, uh, what will be the, the the best for for the applicant. You know, as a either as a kind of joint application or as an individual application. Yeah? That's I think is just uh, if I understood correctly the question. I think that was the question. I hope it answered. Um, well, I think it's time to close. Uh, and I'm going to ask uh, Anna to move on the following slides. OK, before I actually go into the more practical details, I wanted to say thank you very much to all the attendees. And we still have quite a large number. After two hours and a half, we didn't lo lose everybody, which is quite impressive. And um, a very big thank you to all the speakers and a very big thank you to the contributors that have been on the background going through the many different questions we've received and trying to uh, give me indications on who should answer and um, moving forward this session. Uh, thank you also to the technical staff. Um, it is difficult to make take home messages from a session that covers such a, a, a large um, part of the, the statement, such a such a complex issue. What I would do invite you is that um, this statement is available. Um, please read it. Please come back to questions to us if it's need. If you if you feel you need it, we hope this section, this info session, has been useful. Um, as I've explained at the beginning, a question and answer frequently asked question document, a summary of the event, the presentation slides, and the recording will all be published in the EFSA website. Um, the link is actually available in this presentation, but we can also make it more available on the site of the registration. Next slide, please. And with this, I just want to thank you all again uh, to uh, have attended this and to ask you a last favor, which is to take a few minutes and fill out our survey. The link will be sent to you, all of you, by email. Um, it's not easy to do a live session, so your feedback is highly appreciated because we can all improve, but we hope it's useful. Thank you so much and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank <laughs> you.